I know how it seems. Running D&D is this crazy juggling act. Keeping all these balls in the air, you feel like you're riding a catastrophe wave that could collapse at any minute. Well, the good news is, when you fail, it's a question of when, not if. Your friends won't remember. They'll be impressed you could do it at all. And at the end of the day, the price of failure is no big deal. Aw, oh, shucks. I wouldn't have brought them out if I didn't know how to use them. Shucks, I wouldn't put it on unless I was good at it. On today's episode, we're going to talk about failure, uh, catastrophic failure, like happened to me a couple of weeks ago in my D&D game. So those of you who have been following my videos and who remember the episode about the black pudding, uh, you may remember me talking about how that one encounter with this ooze changed my campaign. In fact, it did a lot more than that. It resulted in me killing my boss. And I phrase it that way because that's the most dramatic way I can think of doing it, but that's not how I felt. I felt like I had killed my friend's character. And that was awful. I hated it. I hated everything that happened that night. It was a terrible evening, but we survived it, and we're going to talk about how. In order to really understand what happened, there's going to be a lot of stuff in the doobly-doo for you to download and read at your leisure. It's all optional. You should be able to understand the story without it. For the second Turtle Rock Studios D&D group, I sent an email out to the players, and the title of the email was, The Baron of Bedegar is dead, his family murdered. Now, the political situation in the barony in which the game started, I considered somewhat optional. If the players were interested in engaging with it, that's cool. If they weren't, that's cool too. I had an adventure ready that would have hooks into that politics, but didn't require the players being interested in it. They could just be interested in dungeon delving, and they'd still have a lot of fun, I thought. Now, that email is in the doobly-doo. There's also a description of my campaign setting, which is a one-page description, because I think that way people are more likely to read it. And there's a map and all the stuff you'd expect. And in this description, it talks about how humans don't trust elves and dwarves for various reasons. There's the bad guy who's like 17th level, so it's not something you worry about at low levels, the Invincible Overlord, and he has taken over the entire area. And in order for the dwarves to continue to govern themselves how they want, they have to give the Invincible Overlord slaves. So now the dwarves are famous as slavers. Now, how do you as a dwarf feel about that? That's up to you. One of the players is a dwarf player, and he read that stuff, and he was aware of it, but I think he thought of it as kind of not applying to him. That's Matt's weird campaign stuff. What do I care? I'm a cool dwarf war cleric. Again, that didn't bother me. I didn't think the players had any obligation to engage with this stuff. I think a lot of players like playing non-human characters because they play a human in real life, but I like running games that have a political element to them, and so I tend to run a humanocentric campaign. One of the players, in fact, said, I'm going to play a human druid because everyone in your setting is a xenophobe. That's not literally true. There's nothing racial about the uh, way humans treat dwarves. It's purely because the dwarves made this bargain, this Faustian deal with the Invincible Overlord, and I thought that'd be a cool hook for a dwarf player to be disgusted with that and be here with the humans because he's trying to do something about it. This is all important to the story, stay tuned. So there's the original email I sent out describing the central tension of the campaign, and we'll do a video on central tensions later. I think they're critically important to a good campaign. And then I sent out uh, the campaign uh, one-page summary, which talked about how many of these species don't trust each other because of the pressure of the Invincible Overlord. And then the players found this super important artifact called the Shield of Andrum. And the Shield of Andrum is one of a set. There's a shield, there's a sword, there's a crown, and they confer nobility. Andrim is the name of the entire map that I present the players, and there hasn't been a king of Andrim for a long time. Somebody with the shield of Andrim could declare themselves the king of Andrim, and especially if they were a hero who had saved the town, or maybe even the entire barony, people would follow them. And when our players took the shield to their friendly neighborhood high-level wizard NPC, he expressly told them, whatever you do with that, do not take it to the city of Bedegar Keep, because stuff that's happening there is bad news. I don't trust the regent. It's best that you guys keep it. You're going to go into the swamp anyway and go fight some goblins. So armed with this information, the players made a decision. They needed new armor, they needed better weapons, and the only place they could get heavy armor and heavy weapons was Bedegar Keep. So they strode into Bedegar Keep all unawares. Up until this point, there was no need for them to pay attention to the politics of the city. But from one point of view, that ignorance cost them. In fact, it cost one player his character. When the players entered Bedegar Keep, I showed them the map, which you can see here, and I described all the places they were to visit. They could go to the blacksmith, they could go to the tavern. There's a church in town, and that's unusual because up until now I had described every town in the area as having a ruined church. In fact, the players had visited a ruined church, and I described that the Invincible Overlord does not like organized religion. In fact, he doesn't like much organization that isn't his own. 
And in each instance, I thought there was a reason the players would visit each of these. One of the players needed new arms and armor, so he'd go to the blacksmith. I expected the thief to want to go to the inn, the tavern, and do some investigation and find out, hey, what's going on in this town? I expected maybe one of the players to go to the church and check it out. Why is there a church here? But the players didn't do almost any of that. Uh, they wanted to go visit the wizard and get their stuff identified. They had magic items they wanted to get identified, and they were friends with this wizard. But they also had a note, which you can see here, and which you can download, describing the bad guy's plan to kidnap this wizard. So they arrive in town and they all decide to go see the wizard with one exception. The dwarf says, I don't care about visiting the wizard. I want to go to the blacksmith and get a new suit of armor and a new weapon because the black pudding corroded his. So the dwarf war priest goes to the blacksmith. Everyone else goes to visit the wizard. They knock on the door and a knight opens the door. Now, the last time the players had visited this wizard, it was in his mobile tower, his Darren's Instant Fortress, which was something they found on the road while they were trying to track him down. And just like then, when they arrived at his mobile tower, there was a knight there. And when they knocked on the door, this knight opened the door. But that knight was an ally of the wizard and the players got to know her, Lady Avelina. These knights were unknown to the players. Now, there were two knights in the tower at this point, Knights of the Black Rose. And unbeknownst to the players, these are high level bad guy knights. Most of them are fighters, a couple of them are evil paladins. Specifically, I think of them as Illriggers from this great issue of Dragon Magazine. Stay with me, this story has an ending. The two knights look at each other and say, who are you guys? And the heroes say, we are friends of the wizard Tace. And they say, really? Well, the wizard is missing. And the players say, well, we just saw him not even a week ago. And the two knights look at each other and they whisper and they talk to each other and they say, you may be the last people to see the wizard alive. Would you be willing to come talk to the regent and tell him what happened? Now, this is a critical moment because from this point forward, the player's options begin to narrow. And they sensed this, but didn't know what they could do about it. One of the players said, wait, are these knights the same knights that we met last time? And I said, no, these knights have black roses on their heraldry. So that was an ill omen. Now these knights had a plan. Let's get these rat catchers, these mercenaries, into the keep away from prying eyes where we can accuse them of whatever we want and then hang them. And in the morning, the townspeople will wake up and see these dead adventurers and we'll tell them these are the people that kidnapped and killed our wizard, thereby relieving themselves of any guilt. So these knights are acting suspiciously, but I didn't want them to act too suspiciously because then it would be obvious and they are trying to trick the players. The players agree. Their leader is the wizard Skoros, their PC wizard who is a very lawful good character and basically goes along with whatever the law says and whatever the right thing to do is. So when these knights say, will you come with us and talk to the regent? He's like, sure. And everyone goes with him. So as they go from the wizard's tower to the keep, they pick up another knight. Now there are three knights guarding them. As you can see, their window has narrowed. Now they can take on two knights, probably three knights, that's still doable. But then they enter the keep without any objection and they end up outside the regent's receiving room in this little foyer. And now there are four knights and the players are now very suspicious. One of them says, can I make a roll to see if I suspect anything? And that kind of baffled me because I felt like you suspect them. You obviously have a suspicion, otherwise you wouldn't be asking me that act on that suspicion. But I realized that what the player really wanted was some kind of objective, omniscient narrator confirmation of that suspicion. So I said, yeah, go right ahead and roll, make an intuition check. He rolled really high. And so I texted the player, you are being set up. Now, at that point, I really think the only thing the players could do would be attack these four knights, because from this point forward, things are only going to get worse. Their options are only going to narrow. But the player tried to go to the bathroom. Do you mind if I excuse myself, go to the privy? And the four knights, of course, don't want these people going anywhere. They're trying to trap them and say, no, no one visits the privy while you're waiting to talk to the regent. And at that point, the players were ushered in to see the regent. And now there are six knights. There is the evil priest and the regent, the regent of Bedegar, Lord Saxton. I tried to pick a name that was ominous. The players are now in this long hallway with big stained glass windows. This is where the Baron of Bedegar used to receive people and his throne remains empty. Near Nearby is a much smaller throne that the regent uses, and he asks the players to describe what happened when they saw Tace, and they start telling him, but he is not really interested. This was all a ruse, getting the players away from the public, getting them away from the townspeople into this you know, room where it's just him and his knights, and they can do whatever they want. So he starts saying some ominous things to the players. The PC wizard, Skoro, says, hang on a minute, wait a minute. We didn't have anything to do with the disappearance of Tace. We have this note from the bad guys saying how they're going to kidnap the wizard. The regent says, may I see that note? And the wizard Skoro says, absolutely, here you go. The regent takes it, looks at it, and rips it up. He says, arrest those men. Because I wanted to remove any ambiguity at this point, and the players were wondering why they're being arrested, I had the regent turn to his priest and say, we can pin the disappearance on the wizard on these rat catchers. No one will guess that we had anything to do with it. 
Now, that was the end of that session. I said, we'll pick it up next week and it'll be initiative. The player spent the next week talking about what they could do. The thief player asked me, is it reasonable for me to have my thieves tools like hidden about my person so that if I'm captured and searched, they won't find them? I said, dude, as far as I'm concerned, you always have your thieves tools hidden about your person. You're a thief. I mean, unless you're in the dungeon, in which case it makes sense to have them handy. Otherwise, when you're in town, why would you have them anywhere else? I wanted that player to understand that if he got captured, he would probably be able to get out of a jail cell using his thieves tools. Meanwhile, the wizard player said, guys, I don't know about you, but I'll be able to get out of here. I have invisibility memorized. Also, the druid player said, I don't know about you guys, but I can turn into a spider and I can get out of here. If we end up in jail, I can just slip through the bars. So I felt as though we had a pretty good session lined up for the next week. The players were going to get arrested. They were going to end up in jail and they were going to try to find a way out. And they would discover what had happened to the dwarf player who wasn't with them. Remember, the dwarf war priest was talking to the blacksmith and something extraordinary happened. I would switch between the players in the keep and the dwarf at the blacksmith and go back and forth to try to keep everybody engaged. And so the dwarf, while he was at the blacksmith, walks up to this huge human. It's a very large blacksmith. There are lots of people in here doing work and lots of customers. The dwarf says, uh, excuse me, Master Smith, I need some new armor and a new weapon. And the smith spits on the ground and says, I do not deal with slavers. Now, this was the first time the dwarf player ever had to deal with that prejudice. And I was sort of curious as to what he would do because this was a player who hadn't done a lot of role playing up until now. I was kind of amazed the dwarf player went for it. He role played, he spoke in character. He was a dwarf. He wasn't gonna let this guy talk to him like this. And he wasn't a slaver. And he told the Smith, I'm not a slaver. In fact, I saved the people of Gravesford, the nearby town, near to Bedegar Keep. There was being attacked by undead and my friends, and I saved that whole place. He gave an impassioned, in-character speech. I was impressed, but I thought it would probably take a little bit more than, you know, one mouthy dwarf to change this blacksmith's mind. So I said, all right, I'll give you a 20% chance that someone from the nearby town of Gravesford that you had saved is here in Bedegar Keep. I mean, this is the local big city, so of course there's people moving back and forth all the time. So the dwarf player rolled percentile dice and rolled a 19. So so I had a customer in the smithy say, he's right, he's telling the truth, I was there, I remember him. They're heroes, they saved us. The blacksmith was like, wow, I, I guess I was wrong. At this point, the dwarf pushed his luck, I think because he was trying to get better prices for his gear, and he said, you're right, I'm a hero. In fact, I'm a friend of Tace, the Baron's wizard. Tace, your town's wizard. You should be nice to me. At that point, he feels fingers pinching his elbow, and a figure, a small figure at his side, and he turns and he looks, and there's a halfling there. And the halfling says, uh, excuse me, friend, your voice carries. Shouldn't we be talking about this outside? And the dwarf player realizes that uh, something strange is going on. He goes, um, uh, yeah, let's talk outside. He asks the Smith to hang on a minute, and he and the halfling go outside. So at this point, I take the dwarf player outside, and we role play his conversation with the halfling out of earshot of the rest of the group. So they, and for the next week, have no idea what happened between the dwarf and the halfling. The halfling says, what's wrong with you? Don't you know what's going on? Don't you know that Tace is missing because he was loyal to the Baron? The Baron and his family were murdered, and everyone thinks the regent did it? And the dwarf says, whoa, no, I had no idea. The halfling says, where are your friends? Where's the rest of the party that saved the people of Gravesford? And the dwarf says, well, they're all talking to the wizard. And the halfling says, oh my god, the Black Rose are going to arrest them, take them to the regent, and they're going to be accused of the wizard's murder. The halfling says, what would you be willing to do to save your friends? And the dwarf said, I would be willing to do anything. I would risk my life to save my friends. Of course he would. He's a dwarf. The halfling says, yeah, okay, having you guys owe us a favor isn't bad. And if you guys can find Tace and save him, then Tace would owe us a favor. And that's not bad either. All right, I'll help you out, the halfling says, and reaches behind his neck and pulls out like on a leather thong this key. And he snaps the key off and he says, this is a skeleton key to the Baron's prisons. Now, the regent may have changed the locks, but if he hasn't, this will get you in or out of any door in the jail. He says, now, how can we hide this about your person so that they won't find you if you happen to get arrested? They'll search you. I know, come here, he says. Now, the player who plays this dwarf has this great beard. So I walk up and I make like I'm trying to fiddle with his beard. And I say, the halfling starts braiding the key into your beard. He says, they'll never look for it here. The dwarf player thinks this is awesome. He's like, oh, this is going to be amazing. Yeah, and my beard, smart. Then the halfling draws a picture of the keep in the sand and says, this is the keep and this is the wizard's tower nearby. And this is the secret corridor that connects the two underground in the same level as the jails. So if you can get your friends out, you don't have to try to escape through the keep. You can escape through the secret corridor and up and out through the wizard's tower. The dwarf is now incredibly stoked because he is certain he knows what's going to happen. They're going to get arrested. They're going to be in jail and he's going to help bust them out. And that's kind of what I thought was going to happen. But that's not what happened. So here is this week's lesson. Never take away your player's agency. I mean, I'm sure there are going to be people in the comments that say, oh, I've done it before and it worked great. Well, fine. I'm sure there are exceptions. But I have now done this three or four times since I was 15. And every single time it has failed. 
anytime you set your players up in a situation where they have to surrender, they will not. You can begin an adventure with the players captured in jail. In fact, that's how Out of the Abyss begins, and I think it's fantastic. But you can't put the players in that scenario. They will never go for it. They will always try to fight their way out. In fact, they will fight their way out on purpose, even if they know they will fail, just to be stubborn, just to show you how much they hate it. And you know what? I've done the same thing as a player. Even as a player, this is why I should have known. And whatever happens from here on out, it is not the player's fault. It's my fault. I set them up for this. I should not have. I should have known better. I've had the same thing happen to me as a player, and I hated it, and I rebelled at it the same way they did. Nobody throws me my own guns and says, ride. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody throws me my own gun and says run. Nobody. So the next week when it was initiative, the dwarf player is sitting there waiting for them to get captured. He's super excited to see what's going to happen. But the players have concocted their own plan. Now, since the week before, they have sort of realized the scenario they're in. They realize they have brought the shield of Andrim to the regent. They have brought him the thing he needs to legitimize his rule. The one thing their NPC buddy, Taste the Wizard, told them not to do. So now they're going to do anything to stop him from getting that shield, including risk their own lives, including suicide if it comes down to it. And you know what? That's super dramatic. And in a sense, it worked. There was an epic battle in which the wizard gave his pack to the half-orc fighter. The half-orc fighter has the shield. And now the half-orc fighter has the shield and the wizard's spellbook. The wizard was very afraid of his spellbook getting captured by the bad guys. The wizard then casts invisibility on the half-orc. He had originally planned on casting it on himself, kind of selfishly, so that he knew he would escape. But now he's doing it selflessly. He's saying, you go invisible, take the shield, take all our gear, get out of here. And this amazing chess game played out where the bad guys attacked the player character wizard to disrupt his concentration. That caused the half-orc to go from being invisible to visible. Then the bad guy priest casts whole person on the orc and freezes the orc. Then the good guys attack the evil priest and disrupt his concentration, causing the orc to be able to move again. Back and forth it goes, players go down, players go back up. These knights turn out to be incredibly tough. But so are the players. Three of them escape. Two of them are captured. The wizard is attacked by one of the paladins and goes down in one shot because I had sort of forgotten, or maybe I didn't even really know, that the third level wizard at max hit points has 10 hit points. So in fact, I did enough damage to him to kill him outright. But I said, no, 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 they're not trying to kill you. They're attacking to subdue. Remember, they want you guys to hang in the morning. They don't want to kill you here where no one's watching. Now, from one point of view, that was an epic battle. But from another point of view, it was miserable because the players were constantly describing how they felt like they had no choice. They felt like there was nothing they could do. They felt like they had been railroaded. And that made me feel bad. So I wasn't having a good time. So even though if this had been any other scenario, I think everyone would have thought, wow, that was an epic battle. It didn't feel that way. It felt like this intense struggle for control over player agency. The three players escape. They steal some horses. They ride to the blacksmith. They find the dwarf and they say, we got to get out of here. The dwarf says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to tell you what happened. And the players say, no, no, no time to explain. Get on the horse. The dwarf says, okay, and gets on the horse and they ride out of town. So four of the players are out of town, two of the players are captured. The two captured players wake up in the jail. They're not sure how much time has gone by, and I think that's maybe an important point. As far as they knew, they could be about to be hung. You'll be caught and damn well hung. I think he looks pretty well. Madam, please, nothing just about me looking pretty well hung already. We have no time. The guard is one of the knights. It's not a typical man at arms. This is a powerful knight, one of the knights that almost killed them a minute ago. The two players who were captured, the wizard and the druid, ask me to describe the jail cell. Reasonable request. They say, can I see the other player? Are the walls barred or are they stone walls? And I said, well, let me draw it out for you. That was a mistake. Me drawing it on the battle mat sent the signal that this was a combat encounter, and the implication with a combat encounter is that there is a way to win. But I didn't mean either of those things. I didn't intend this to be a combat encounter at all, and I certainly didn't think there was a way for them to get out of this. They were both manacled so they couldn't cast spells. But I didn't know what kind of signal I was sending, so I drew the jail on the mat, and I put the paladin guard where she was, and I put the PCs where they were in opposite jail cells, and they shared a language. They could talk to each other, which I didn't know, which meant when they were in the foyer, and the druids suspected that these guys were trying to set them up, he could have said something in a language that the paladins and the guards couldn't understand, and maybe come up with a scenario where they could jump the guards when there were only four of them. So these two players captured start talking about how they might be able to get out, and the wizard player, incredibly bravely, said, I am going to say the worst, most hateful, most disgusting things I can to this female guard to get her to come over here and face me. 
Now, the actual player, my friend Phil, is not that bad a guy, so he doesn't know what to say that would cause her to do that, but just telling me my character says those things was enough. And it worked, there may have been a die roll, I don't remember, and the guard walks up, opens the door to his jail, walks into his cell, and says, you're to hang in the morning. No one said you needed a tongue to do that. The implication here was clear, she's gonna cut out his tongue if he keeps talking. And at this point, because of the way the jail cells were situated, she has her back to the druid player. And unbeknownst to me, Wild Shape is not a spell. You don't need your hands free to be able to do it. So the druid player turns into a spider behind the guard's back and escapes. And now at this point, everyone has escaped except the wizard player. The paladin on guard, Lady Morgan, seeing that the druid has escaped behind her back, draws her sword and executes Skoros the wizard. And at that point, all hell broke loose. The wizard player had no problem with the reality of that. It was clear to him that he was at her mercy and she could do this anytime she wanted. He was just trying to distract her so the druid could escape. But what he didn't know, or what he hadn't considered, was that this humiliated her and that made her incredibly angry. And she is not a regular man at arms. She is an evil bad guy paladin that we are setting up to be the recurring villains of this adventure. First of all, she had no idea that either of the PCs could escape, and now one of them under her charge is gone. And as far as she was concerned, the other player character could do the same thing. And there was no way she was going to her boss, the regent, and saying, I let them both go. Angry at being humiliated and wanting to make sure that she was at least able to tell her boss one of them didn't get away, she executes the wizard. Now, it's reasonable for somebody watching this and listening to this to think, I did that to teach somebody a lesson. But nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, he was maybe the only player I would have gone that far with because of all the players at the table, my friend Phil playing the wizard was the one who was the most skeptical of me letting the players off the hook. He's the one who would say, oh, Matt's taking it easy on us. In fact, at one point he said, you took it easy on us last night. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, no, I know what you did. You stopped kind of paying attention to how we were managing light because you knew that otherwise we were going to get smoked by these goblins in the mine. And I was like, Phil, I don't really know how the rules for light work. I didn't do anything to take it easy on you. I just forgot. But that's how he thinks. And, and I guess maybe I'm projecting too, because that's how I think as a player. I'm always kind of, because I'm a GM, I'm always kind of aware of when the dungeon master is making allowances behind the screen to keep the players alive when it otherwise wouldn't be realistic. So I thought of all the players there, he was the one who wouldn't let me get away with it. I felt like I had to do the most realistic, plausible thing. And in that moment to me, there was no way a humiliated evil knight was gonna let this guy live. When Lady Morgant realized that all the awful things the wizard had said were just a trick, and not only had she been tricked, but the result of the trick was that the druid player had escaped, she was humiliated, and in her anger, she was capable of anything. Now, when the druid player heard this, he said, you know what, I go back in there and commit suicide against the knight. I don't want to play anymore. This is how unhappy everybody was. A large percentage of the players thought, this is it, we're not playing D&D &D anymore, everything has collapsed. Phil got up and left. Now, we are playing at work, so Phil is now walking around the office at 9 o'clock at night, and the other people who are there late working are like, hey, Phil, what's going on? How's D&D? And he is furious. My friend Wes said, well, Matt runs a pretty fair game. I guess if you died, then there was a good reason. And Phil was like, no, there was not a good reason. Part of this is the fact that all through this, the players had kind of been bouncing around from one encounter to the next without a whole lot of rhyme or reason. And of all the players, Phil was the most upset by this. He was often asking, why are we doing this? He was the player who was the most upset that they didn't think enough, and he's the one that paid the price for everything. So it was maximally unjust. Phil walked around, talked to some of the other employees, blew off some steam, and came back, sat down, and said, okay, I just need to talk about what happened. And that's another lesson. When a catastrophe like this occurs, it's important that everybody just talk it out. Describe your perspective to the players. Why did everything happen? You know, normally I do not tell the players what their choices are. I do not tell the players what they could do in town. I do not tell the players what they could do in battle. Because I sort of feel like that's taking some of the fun away from the players. It's disrespectful. Part of the fun of D&D is you as a player coming up with this stuff. But a lot of these players have never played before. They literally don't know what their traditions are that I take for granted. So we spent the next two hours talking about what had just happened. The druid player explained that the reason he committed suicide against the paladin was because he didn't want to play anymore if Phil wasn't going to play. But Phil's reaction was, what are you talking about not going to... As far as Phil was concerned, we were going to keep playing. He was just really angry now and wanted to talk about what happened. I explained the paladin's point of view, which I normally don't do, but this situation demanded it. And Phil thought about it and said, okay, yeah. All right, that makes sense. I buy it. And the party kind of talked the druid player down. Admittedly, he had been complaining about having migraines all night. So that's another lesson. Don't play angry. Don't play with migraines. 
you know, there are a lot of things, you know, we'd all been at work for eight hours up until then. And so there are a lot of things that contribute to players making bad decisions. There are a lot of things that contribute to DMs making bad decisions. After about half an hour, Phil started to think about his new character. I said, you want to roll stats? And he said, yes. Now, if you've watched my videos before, you know I have my own system for generating stats. You roll 4d6, take the highest three, but you do them in order. So your first roll is your strength, your second roll is your dex, and that way players don't bring their own baggage to the table and you get this cool oracular process of discovering your character. But the flip side of that rule is, if that character doesn't live, you get to roll the normal way, which is roll 4d6, take the highest three, and place them wherever you want so you can play whatever character you want. Immediately, Phil started to roll up a new warlock, and he was really excited by this warlock, and I quoted my friend Mark, who once said to me, you know, Matt, when you kill one of my characters, I am really legitimately angry at you. For about half an hour, I, I am furious at you. And he said, let me be furious. Do not try to change what happened to bring my character back from the dead just because I'm unhappy, because that's also not satisfying. That's not what would have happened. Just let me be angry for about half an hour, and then I'll relax, and I'll start thinking about my new character. And when I told the party this, Phil smiled and nodded and said, it's literally been half an hour, and now I'm back to wanting to play this new character. The other players had never really thought about what would happen when someone died. For many of them, a player dying meant that was it, that was the end of D&D. And we had to explain, especially Phil and I who'd played D&D a lot before, that look, no, a player dying is not the end of the game. When the druid player realized this, he said, okay, well, then in that case, I would not have gone in and committed suicide. And at this point, it started to feel like, okay, we're all going to get to keep playing together. Now, the dwarf player finally says, guys, can I tell you what happened with me and the halfling? And he describes this whole scenario. They had in their pocket the entire time the opportunity for the dwarf to bust them out of jail. But the party never really got arrested. Only two of the players did. And then one of them escaped and the other one was killed. So the dwarf never got to do his cool stuff. Now, we've played several times since then. We're going to play again Monday. And everything seems to be back to normal. And the players are a more cohesive group now than they were before. In fact, I think every time we play, the group is a little bit more tight-knit. And my friend Phil, who lost his wizard, is now playing a warlock, and he spent more time on that character's backstory than all the other players put together. He made it a point to make his character from the Barony of Bedegar. So he knows all this stuff. He knows who all the bad guys are. He knows what happened to the Baron. He knows what anyone from this area would know. All the stuff that the players have, up until now, kind of been ignoring. So even though he lost a character, he is super engaged with what's going on. Also, he has a lot more hit points now, so it's a lot more likely he'll live. So what are the lessons to be taken away from this? One, my overwhelming piece of advice to you is never put the players in a situation where you're taking their agency, their ability to decide their own fate away from them. In other words, never put a gun to their head and say, surrender, because they won't. They will come up with a perfectly plausible, reasonable way to escape and try to thwart whatever plan you have. Like I said, I'm sure there's someone who's going to say, no, 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 we've done it before, it works fine. But in my experience, that's never happened. Even as a player, whenever I'm a DM, anytime the players are in a scenario where the DM thought they should or would surrender, they never do. Then when Phil's character Skoros died, Phil was very mature about the whole thing. He got incredibly angry, right? But he got up and he left and he walked it off. And then he came back and said, let's talk about what happened. I need to understand it. And I explained my point of view. And now, of course, thanks to the dwarf, the players have made contact with the local thieves guild that have some interest in maybe getting some new allies. I wrote up a cool little narrative thing you can download in the doobly-doo that I then emailed to the players to show them they're not alone. I also wrote a long email to the players. I basically recapitulated the video, The Railroad versus the Sandbox, and I explained to them something I never had. I had given them all this setting material, but I had never told them, what kind of game do I run? What am I like as a DM? Right now, if you're just starting out, you might not know what you're like as a DM, but I do. I know exactly what kind of game I run. I know what kind of players I value. I know what kind of scenarios I concoct. And I didn't communicate any of this to the players. Why not? Because I'm an idiot. You're an imbecile. Because I am perfectly capable of screwing up just like anybody else. So when I finally wrote this email saying, look, guys, I put these things in front of you, the politics of the area, the various adventures I have ready, and you can pick any of them up or ignore them. I don't mind. But I also run the kind of game where you can get yourselves in over your head. You can get yourselves in trouble. I don't expect that just because I set up a combat encounter that there is a way for you guys to solve it. It's entirely possible you guys could get yourself into a situation because of the choices you made that is suicidal. In which case, I would expect you to retreat or surrender. And the players had never thought about that. They didn't know that because I had never told them. So if you have some idea of what kind of DM you're going to be, tell your players ahead of time. Say, this is the kind of game I run. Don't just say this is the campaign setting. Don't just say, well, here are how my elves are different than D&D &D elves. Talk about who you are as a dungeon master. What kind of game you like running? What kind of players do you value? Or maybe a better way of putting it is what kind of behavior do you value in your players? 
right? I like players who are motivated, who have their own ambition, who want to achieve things in the world. So for instance, the players have found through their own decision making, I did not put this in front of them, they found and took the shield of Andrum for themselves, which means now if they wanted to, one of the players could declare himself king of Andrum. And if that player has saved a lot of people, people would flock to him. But again, that's up to the players. So I took the time to write an email to explain to them, this is the kind of game I run, which I should have done months ago. Uh, we sat down and talked for two hours about what had happened. I explained my point of view. I explained why the bad guys behaved the way they did. And the players at the end of the night ultimately thought, okay, well, actually that was pretty epic. Skoros gave his life so that the Druid could escape. And as a result, everyone had escaped except the wizard. If there was any player at the table who was gonna sacrifice his character's life so that everyone else could escape, it was Phil. That's why Phil didn't cast invisibility on himself, he cast it on the fighter, so the fighter could get out with the shield, so they could achieve their new objective of do not let the regent get the shield of Andrim. And he didn't. And now they've got some epic bad guys that are on their tail. Right, I mean, what a great way to introduce some bad guys. Maybe there's a way to do it without sacrificing a player though. So at the end of the day, I don't think the players did anything wrong. I don't think they did anything stupid. I do feel their choices got more and more narrow as they went and they didn't detect that at first. And once they did detect it, they weren't sure what they could do. And I didn't tell them what they could do because I felt like I don't wanna tell you guys what to do. Then uh, I'm kind of taking some of the fun away from you. But since then, I have made it a point to remind them of things they know, to remind them of their options. You know, the players interrogate an orc and say, is there a secret way into Black Spire Keep? And the orc says, no. And I say, well, he seems to be telling the truth. And the players talk about it and I have to remind them, don't forget, you guys know of a secret way in that you found out back in the mine from the goblins. Now, normally I wouldn't tell my players that. I would expect them to live or die on their own, uh, you know, on their wits. But again, these are new players with one or two exceptions. None of them have ever played D&D before. So that's the catastrophe episode. Lesson number one, do not take agency away from your players. Lesson number two, communicate to your players and tell them what kind of DM you're gonna be, what kind of adventure you're gonna run, and don't be afraid to tell them what you think is likely to happen based on the scenario they've concocted. Don't be afraid of failure because it's gonna happen. Failing doesn't matter. What matters is how you respond to that failure. Be open to your players' complaints. Speak openly about what you thought about your motivation, about why things went the way they did. My campaign suffered what I thought for a little while might be a fatal catastrophe, but my friends and I talked about it and we got over it and we fixed it and we're still playing. Next time we get together and play, which is tomorrow night, the player is going to try and infiltrate Broken Spire Keep, which I think is going to be part of the climax of this first book of the campaign. They have a lot of ideas about how to lay siege to or infiltrate Broken Spire Keep. They thought about sending the druid in disguised as a tiny animal. They thought about sending the warlock in using visibility or having the warlock cast invisibility on the ranger or the thief so they could go in and scout the place and get a map and find out where are all the bad guys? Where are the prisoners? But so far they've managed to ambush and kill several different patrols and they've gotten some information about what's going on inside the keep and they've reduced the numbers of the people in the keep a little bit and they even know about a back door, a secret way in, but it's going to require them doubling back and that might take a while and the bad guys might get reinforcements. So I'm as excited as anybody to find out what happens next. I'm feeling a lot better, by the way. I'm not 100%. I'm like 95%. Let me know what you guys want to see next as far as episodes go. I'm thinking about doing an episode on alignment. I'm thinking about doing an episode on setting up cool bad guys. I still want to do an episode where we build a campaign together because I think that's the kind of thing that makes running Dungeons and Dragons uniquely fun. Also, of course, we're going to do episodes about prepackaged campaign setting. We'll talk about the Forgotten Realms and Greyhawk and about a bunch of other campaign settings that might be a little bit more obscure. But if we do build a campaign together, it's probably going to be something where we get together on Twitch and I run Hexographer and we generate a random map and I look to the chat channel and say, okay, what are we going to call this mountain range and who lives here? And tell me something interesting about this mountain range that's a secret that the players might not know. And after we've done that with all the different regions and features, we'll have a campaign map. I'm on the Pacific coast. So if we get together on Twitch, it's probably going to be on the weekend. It's probably going to be around, you know, in the afternoon, let's say noonish. So far, this is like episode 16 or 17. And I've promised to do a lot of stuff in these episodes, but I've forgotten most of those promises. So if you remember when I said, oh, we'll talk about this in a future episode, let me know in the doobly doo. As always, there are no ads in this channel and I have no Patreon, but if you want to support the channel, I encourage you to come by my Amazon page. There's a link in the doobly doo. I am an independent author. I write fantasy novels. If you like D&D, if you like fantasy, you might like them. Read the description, read the reviews, you might like them. Next week we talk about, well, what do you want to talk about? I'm as eager to find out as you are. Until next time, peace, out.